Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but upon whom it falls, it will grind him to powder. Matthew chapter 21 from verse 42 to 44. Good day, MOPM, everybody on the planet. I'm Apostle Constance Friday, alias. And today we're about to look at the scripture. And God bless you. I pray as you listen, that you're listening with, without mortal ears, but with ears that are sensitive to the words of the Spirit. Because what I'm about to share with you is very important and is very important as life itself. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. As an apostle of lies and an apostle of truth, it's my responsibility to let you know the truth that will set you free. Now, the title of today's message is SSM. SSM. Satanic Scriptural Misquotations. Satanic Scriptural Misquotations. Now, before I continue out the let you know that the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Christ has come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. And uh, the the ultimate goal of the the reason why the devil was kicked out of heaven was because the devil was trying to usurp power and take over the seat or the position of God. And because of that, the devil is out in this time and age to drag many down with him. Let's look at Matthew chapter twenty-four from verse three to fourteen. If you read Matthew twenty-four from verse three to fourteen. Specifically, when you come all the way down to verse, all the way up to verse, um, verse 10 and verse 11, it says, And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of the lawless, because lawlessness we are bound and love of many we grow cold. Verse 13 now says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved, and the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then to the end shall come. Now verse 11 says, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. The word many, circle of the word many, it means there are many people right now that are being deceived by the devil. By the SSMs of the devil, the satanic scriptural misquotations of the devil. What are satanic scriptural misquotations? These are uh, the, the misquotations and the misalignment of the scripture by agents of the devil or people who or false prophets who have risen up to deceive many in this time and age. I also want to let you know that the devil can quote the scripture and the devil has his agents here and there who quote the scripture and misquote the scripture. And then as a result of that, this is how you to see God and Christ in the light and the way He is. You get to see God and Christ in the wrong way. And at the end of the day, you are worshipping something else rather than worshipping God. You are worshipping materials, you are worshipping mammon, and you are worshipping other things. And you are seeking other things rather than the kingdom of God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and every other thing shall be added unto you. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 4 from verse 2 to 11. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 2 to 11. This is a very important part of the scripture. In this part of the scripture, the devil tempted Jesus Christ. And he said, when Jesus was led up to the spirit, okay, let me start from verse 2. It says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, Command these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. For every wrong scriptural misquotation the devil threw at Jesus, Jesus Christ rearranged, rearranged, counter, counter, counter the misquotation with the right quotation. 
because Christ could see through the lame attempt of the devil to tempt him and he could see that the devil was trying to tempt him but he gave him the right scripture to neutralize the misquotation of the devil so for every satanic scriptural misquotation which is being peddled by false preachers and false prophets of these days there is a right quotation for you i'm going to look we are going to look at these satanic scriptural misquotations that are commonly being used in this modern time and age by false preachers and false prophets in fact it has become so bad that uh, some preachers now have cliches you know cliches that they use and uh, when they use it they mislead you and you are even fool some of these cliches are not even in the bible they are not even in the Bible, but people still, you know, because you are in church and you worship something as well than the real God, you follow, you follow a human image, you follow the image of man, rather than the, than, than, the, than the example set by Jesus Christ. You even begin to absorb these cliches and you begin to use, apply them to your lives, but these cliches are not even in the Bible. These cliches and these phrases are not in the Bible. And I'm going to touch, we're going to talk some of this, we're going to touch some of these cliches in this video. So let's look at Matthew. When we, when we go up and say, and the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. And in verse 11, the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Now, what I want to let you know is how the devil misquotes scripture. Now let's look at uh, emphasis on Matthew chapter 4 verse 6. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 6, the devil said to Jesus Christ, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, Jesus was a descendant of King David. And in the book of Psalm, Psalm 91 from verse 11 to 12. Let me open Psalm 91 from verse 11 to 12. Psalm 91 from verse 11 to 12. Which is where the devil tried to utilize to deceive Jesus Christ. He said, from 11 to 12, For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then here the devil took, took out that part of the scripture and misquoted it. His aim was to deceive Jesus Christ and make him do the wrong thing. But Jesus Christ said, from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 16, Jesus Christ Now, listen, if we follow through uh, from, from the very beginning of Matthew chapter 4 all the way down to chapter 11 where the devil left him, you find out that the ultimate, because the devil used three lines, three lines. He, he, he tried three times to get Christ. And the ultimate aim of the devil was to get Jesus Christ to bow and worship him. Because uh, the devil, first of all, tempted him based on the fasting. Now there is this fasting component of our lives. Once you put your hands upon the, upon the plow and take up your calling, as someone who is out to serve God, there's a sort of fasting that you go through. A fasting. Now, it's not the literal fasting we know, but it's a kind of fasting. You know, you are, you are like set aside from, from the secular or the normal usual life you wear. And you come into the work of God. And, and, and you, you come out of darkness and come into light. Because you come out of the inferior kingdom of the world and come into the kingdom of God. So there's a sort of separation process, a cleaning process and a fasting process. And then the devil wants to now test that fasting process. Which was the first temptation he meted out to Jesus Christ. He said, if you are the son of, if you are the son of man, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus Christ did not fall for that whim and caprices. You understand? So that was the first test. And I said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. Then the second aim of the devil was to mislead you. Must mislead you in such a way that he would destroy you. To make you destroy yourself or to make you self-destruct. And then he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. And he even took something from the ancestral line of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ's ancestry or ancestral line was from that the body from the line of King David. Because in several occasions in the Bible, Jesus Christ was called Jesus, son of 
David from the royal of the tribe of from the tribe of Judea. Judah, okay. So, but Jesus Christ said, "It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God." Then the ultimate aim of the devil was for for people to stop worshiping God, for you to stop worshiping the real God, for you to stop following the real way and to follow him. And the devil is a mastercraft of deception. And that's why in Genesis chapter 1, he used the most subtle, the most subtle creature on earth to deceive mankind into the fall of, human, of, of humanity. The fall of mankind from the state of glory to the state of sin. Let's skew back and rewind to Genesis, the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis, and let's go back to the temptation and the fall of man from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he, and he said to the woman, As God did said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it. Now the first thing this devil does is to deceive. He misleads you and deceives you. You understand? It makes you feel that what is right is not right. And what is right is archaic. What is right is out of date. And it makes you feel that what is right does not apply to the things of God. So he, may, he told the woman, you will not surely die. And he tries to let you make you feel like, you know, God is being unfair and God is just being bad to you or God is new. Whereas God is not bad, God is good. Now, there are three modus operandi of the devil. We have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But it starts with the lust of the eyes. And the woman saw, lust of the eyes, that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. That is verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. And she took up the fruit and ate, which is lust of the child. They both ate. And they were there, the eyes were open, and they saw they were naked, and they sued fig trees to cover themselves. Pride of life. Pride of life is a situation where you're trying to cover your nakedness. You are like you're trying to you're trying to uh, act like you, you ain't got no you don't have no weaknesses. You don't you don't do the things that other people do. You act like you don't you don't you don't you don't get hungry, you don't get thirsty, you don't feel pressed to ease yourself or do all these things. All these things are just pride of life. And that's why like God says he exhausts the he exhausts the humble and resists the proud. Now let's continue. Um we are looking at the satanic misquotations of the scripture. The, the, the devil misleads. He misquotes the scripture. And the ultimate aim of the devil is to make what is right look bad and make what is bad look good. He makes what, what is good and what is the truth look like a lie and makes what looks like a lie and what is real look like the truth. He makes light, the devil makes the light look like darkness and makes the darkness look like light. So at the end of the day, instead of worshipping God, are worshiping Christ, you are worship, you are actually worshiping the devil. You are in church, but you are worshiping another God. You are not worshiping the real God. You are not worshiping the all the real God. You claim you carry the Bible, but you are not preaching the real gospel. You are preaching a different gospel. You are preaching the gospel of materialism. You are preaching the gospel of mammon. And at the end of the day, people, society society is is getting worse and worse. And yet we have millions and billions of people who say they represent the kingdom of God. Why? Because the wrong message is being passed. You are passing the wrong message. You are misquoting the scripture and you are, you are an agent of the devil unknowingly. Okay, where in the scripture did they say that, um, that there is something like that, that there is a rich man gospel? Jesus Christ said it is, it is easier for a camel to get into the true eyes of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So where did the gospel of I got money, I got cash, I got money in my bank account, I own cash, I'm a rich guy. I'm a rich guy, Jesus Christ, man. Did Christ come to talk about all this? That's the first question you've got to ask yourself. Okay, let's look at a couple of other things in the scripture that are being misquoted. For example, recently, I was having, I was having, a, I was having a conversation with a brother in the Lord, and he was like, yes, the Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. No, you see, you, you're getting it wrong, and you are misquoting the scripture. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God. It can come in different ways and different forms. Now, the misquotation he gave me that day is from 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 11 to 13. I still remember how he said, but the Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. That is a misquotation of the scripture. Let's look at let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 11 to 13. Everything I do is based, everything I do is, is based on the scripture. 
First King chapter 19 from verse 11 to 13. First King 19, okay, yeah. Now from verse 11, he said, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rock in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was then Elijah heard it. And then he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And then suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And the rest is in the story. You can read all the way down, all the way up. Now, when we go to John chapter, John chapter 2 from verse 13 to 22, we see the place where Jesus Christ went into the, temp into the temple. Went into the temple. And he scattered the temple and he was like, See, my, the house of my father was meant to be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. You've turned it into a den of robbers. Now, what spirit was in Christ? What spirit was in Christ when uh, Saul of Tarsus was arrested on his way to persecute Christians in, in Damascus? Was it the spirit of the devil? So, what are we talking about? The spirit of God has various, various ways and modus operandi you cannot expect the spirit of god to operate only in one way no so that is one of the scriptural misquotations now jesus christ they, they, when we look at the book of john chapter 6 from verse 60 to 61 john chapter 6 from verse 60 to 61 yeah you see 61 said and jesus knew okay let's start from 60 he said therefore many of the disciples when they heard this they said this is a hard saying who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that the disciple complained about it, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The word that I speak as a spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Are you with me? So now, let's continue. You find out that in the ministry of Jesus Christ, from the book of John chapter 6, Jesus Christ began to, began to have a little bit of some of his disciples because his disciples were many. They were plenty. Some of them began to have some issues. They began to misunderstand him because they were not closely connected to Christ. They were just after the things they could get from Christ. So at the end of the day, when you read on, you see, you see um, from verse 16, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus Christ said to the twelve, because there were so many, so many disciples and lots of them left. I said, do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter, who was one of the spearheads of the twelve, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe that, know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered, I said, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Are you with me? So you, you understand. So you can see that the whole the whole situation began to turn around in verse sixty. Now, when we rewind back to John chapter two, well, Jesus Christ avoided the praise of man because during the time lots of people came. They were like, "Hey, Jesus, Jesus, ah, you are too much. You are trying. You are doing this," and they began to avoid the praise of man. Now, when they now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. I repeat, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, why didn't Christ believe? Because he could see their hearts. He could see the hearts of these men. And all he could see was that they were moved by the signs and wonders which he did. Which means they were so attracted by the spectacular, but they were not attracted to the supernatural. They were interested in the spectacular, in the signs and wonders which Christ was displaying. But they were not really after the deep secrets of the kingdom. The deep secrets of the kingdom. As the Bible says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. When you come closer to God, that's when you get to know the deep secrets of the kingdom. Now, in in uh, Matthew chapter 2, you, privately you can read from verse 1 to verse 12 of Matthew chapter 2. But I'm starting from verse 13. It says, 
Now the Passover of the Jew was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cord, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away, and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. For my father's house was meant to be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. Then in verse 19, he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they could not understand the literal meaning of what he was saying. But according to verse 22, he said, After he had risen from the dead, after, uh, after he had risen from the dead, they remembered what he had said, and that is when they believed the scripture which Jesus had said. Now, when you get to John chapter 3, you can see where Nicodemus visited him late at night secretly. And he said, he came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Then Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say unto you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus asked, he asked the question, say, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Then from verse 5, Jesus Christ gave him the denotative interpretation of what he was saying. He said, Most assuredly I say unto you, except one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Verse 12 says, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In the Bible, it is said that the kingdom of God suffered a violence, and the violence taken it by force. And most of us misinterpret what this violence is. The violence we're talking about is not a physical violence, because Jesus Christ told Apostle Peter, Put your sword back into your sheet, for they that live by the sword die by the sword. Put your gun back into your holster, for they that live by the gun die by the gun. Guns are replaceable, but your life is not. Now listen, the violence we're talking about is in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, which, which says that, Ephesians chapter 6, which says that, We wrestle not against flesh nor blood, but against principalities and power, against wickedness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Our battle is in a spiritual manner, and a lot of things matter because there are principles that guide you. You must avoid staining your white shirt you must avoid being a foolish virgin who has like who does not have enough oil and misses the arrival of the groom you must keep your garments spotless you must be the wise servant that 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 sows the talent and brings home profit you must be a tree that yields fruit these are the deep secrets of the kingdom but we tend to misinterpret it we say it's all about money it's all about having cars. It's all about this. And then you are saying that when you are trying to uh, do Christianity, you don't need to follow nobody up. You don't need to follow anybody up. Jesus Christ said to Apostle Peter, Lovest thou me, feed my sheep. Lovest thou me, nurture my lamb. Take care of the new sheep. When the sheep give birth, you have to take care of the lamb so that they can stand well and the flock can increase. So most assuredly, except you are born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there are so many misinterpretations of the scripture. All right, there is this particular one, which is very popular, which mammon preachers are using to mislead many people. And that's why we have a lot of corrupt people in the church who are misrepresenting the kingdom of God and giving the followership of Christ a bad name. Money answered all things. This was said by King Solomon. And then the love of money is the root of all evil. This was said by Apostle Paul. But where in this world, or where in the Bible is it written that the lack of money is the root of all evil? When you lack money, it's probably because you've not done the right things you need to do to get enough money, or you, you've not been able to channel your resources very well, or you are extravagant, you spend your money foolishly, or you are not skilled in financial, in financial management, or you just need to do X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, and get your financial mathematics correct. 
Yeah, that is what you need to do to, to lack money. But I don't know why pastors say the lack of money is the root of all evil. That is not in the Bible. And when you keep preaching this in the church, you keep telling people that you keep telling people that that it is you should go get money by all means. And therefore, they go back to the office after Sunday and they are corrupt and are doing all kinds of things, all kinds of crazy things for money. And they come back to church and they pay their tithes and offering with dirty money, and you take it. Money is not everything, and that's why it is it is easier for a, a for for a camel to enter into the eye of the need uh, of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Material things don't mean nothing. For all these things shall pass away, but the kingdom of God will remain, and it will never pass away. It's written here in the book of Matthew chapter 24. Let's read from verse 15 to 35. Matthew 24 from verse 15 to 35. Matthew 24 from verse 15 to 35. Quickly, it says, Proverbs 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and all the way, let's go all the way down to verse uh, 29, or verse 20, okay, yeah, verse 19. Okay, forgive me, let, let's just say, said, okay, verse 35, he said, um, that is, Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass.